The reason I love teaching BTEC is because it's all about giving learners the knowledge, skills and experience for career success, whatever path they choose. In summer 2019, we'll celebrate outstanding BTEC students, teachers, schools, colleges and training providers from around the world at the 9th Annual BTEC Awards. So this is your chance to nominate your BTEC stars. I think this event is really important because it showcases the diversity of the people doing BTEC. Nominations are now open for 2019. It's easier than ever to enter. There are more chances to recognise outstanding students and great teaching. And there'll be everyone from business leaders to Olympic champions cheering you on. So celebrate your BTEC stars and submit your nomination today. Good morning everyone. Oh, you had tobacco like it. <laughs> Hope there's not too many hangovers uh, in the audience. It sounds like you had a cracking night last night uh, and lots of wonderful stories as well from students and I, I hear there were a few tears as well. So uh, it sounds like it was a good one. Welcome to day two of the Association of Colleges Annual conference and exhibition. Just a reminder about your mobile phones, can you make sure uh, you keep those on silent, uh, but do feel free to, to tweet and the like throughout the day and use the conference app as well, uh, hashtag AOCConf is the one to use if you want to uh, add to the debate on Twitter or have a look at what's been said already if you, ha you weren't here yesterday. Um, We've got another packed day for you again today. Speakers from you know, your world and other worlds as well, bringing their expertise uh, on things that might make a difference to your work. And as I say, if you want to read any more about the uh, Beacon Awards winners last night or the Tez FE Awards shortlists, uh, you can have a look at those on the AOC's website. And again, the app's got tons of information on it as well. So, um, also remember to wear your delegate badges at all times just to make sure you're in the right place as well and you can check what the conference agenda is on, on the app that I mentioned too. Uh, we're very grateful again to the sponsors who make this event happen uh, from all the exhibitors too. Uh, the conference sponsors who I'm sure you know by now are Pearson, Dynastics, Mindful Education, NCFE and JISC. So can we just give them a, a nice warm round of applause again to say thanks. Now, if there is an emergency, if an alarm goes off, I suggest you leave, and if you uh, follow the marshals, they'll be able to direct you to where the easiest exit is uh, to get out. So our first speaker this morning is Carol Stott, MBE, who's chair of the Association of Colleges and the AOC Charitable Trust. Now, Carol's been chair uh, since January 2013, and after nearly six years leading the organisation and the sector, through very interesting times, this is her last conference uh, as chair. So please do give an even louder than usual cheers to welcome to the stage, Carol Stott. Well, uh, thank you very much, Steph, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you all here this morning. The uh, theme for my talk this morning um, is going to be optimism, um, which might seem like a strange theme uh, in the times in which we're living, uh, but I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I have, by now, accumulated uh, many years of work experience, and nearly all of it um, has been in education and the vast majority of it in further and adult education. I've been a teacher, I've been a development worker, a manager, a CEO, and both an executive and a non-executive board member. It's a CV um, that many of you um, will share or have similar, similar versions of. Um, and in all these roles, um, I've tended to refer to myself as a professional optimist. I've always believed that as a teacher, um, it's my job to help people to understand and to really believe that they can learn 
Um, I believe, I think like everyone here, uh, that education is a force for good. It's a route to self-improvement and it's a route to a more rewarding life. At its simplest, education is simply about improving lives. And improvement, I have no doubt, is helped by a positive and an optimistic approach. And as an educator, therefore, I feel I have, I have a professional duty to be an optimist. And about 20 years ago, um, I came across the work of uh, Professor Martin Seligman. Some of you may know his original work uh, was a book called Learned Optimism. And he's had much subsequent research and writing on well-being and positive psychology. Uh, he is a great believer that well-being requires building on the positive, that just trying to eliminate or reduce the factors that have a negative impact on well-being uh, is not enough. And he links this positive attitude and approach with optimism and the more negative with pessimism. And he is very clear that education has a really crucial role to play through building more positive thinking and attitudes. So you can see, I think, why um, I admire him. And when you read Professor Seligman's descriptions of the characteristics of optimism and pessimism, it's very easy to recognize and to relate these to people as they're trying to learn. Um, he describes the three key traits of pessimism as the three Ps. Uh, so pessimists tend to think that failure or misfortune is permanent, it's pervasive, and it's personal. So for example, uh, if you're trying to learn maths and you've just failed your GCSE, the pessimist belief is that this is permanent and it will persist. I can't do maths, I'll never be able to do it. Uh, a pessimist may also believe it's pervasive, that the failure or misfortune applies to more than just this one event or this one aspect of life. So I'm no good at any maths, not really much good at most subjects. And they may also believe it's personal, uh, by which Seligman means they will internalize the cause of the failure, blame themselves when bad things happen. It's me. I'm just stupid. An optimist, on the other hand, takes a more positive attitude. Uh, they don't believe it's permanent. I, I was having a bad day, but if I work a bit harder, then I think I can pass. They may attribute the failure to the specific rather than believing it's pervasive. So um, I'm less good at geometry. It was that that let me down. And they're much less likely to personalize the cause. So my geometry teacher, um, he wasn't very good and he didn't explain things properly. So of course what I've just described is a very simplified summary of a much more nuanced body of work. And, and most of us, of course, are somewhere along the spectrum of optimism and pessimism in relation to all three of those characteristics and how they combine in any situation. And where we are on this spectrum will affect all aspects of our lives. But the consequences of Hobb habitually resorting to the pessimistic view that misfortune is permanent, pervasive, and personal is that it creates a deep sense of helplessness, that failure and misfortune afflict you and there's nothing you can do to change it. Actually, Seligman himself says he's more naturally inclined towards pessimism, and he constantly tries to learn, and indeed to teach others, how to develop a more positive and optimistic attitude and approach. And what I'm talking about is not advocating blind optimism. Um, we all certainly need a good dose of realism, and it's important for us to accept responsibility for our actions and their consequences. At its extreme, blind optimism um, is, is just delusion, just as extreme pessimism is despair. 
And very clearly, there are times when it's much easier to be optimistic. So at the moment, I think I am suffering the disappointment that is um, an almost inevitable consequence of being an optimist. I think things in further education are most definitely as tough as I have ever known um, throughout my career. And government reluctance or inability to tackle the core issue is deeply, deeply disappointing. In fact, it's, it's short-sighted, it's ignorant, and it makes me very angry. Um, but as the National Institute of Economic and Social Research noted in their recent report on UK productivity, the standout problem is the continuing skills issues. And the particularly, and I quote, the underinvestment in vocational education and training. Now, I would assert it's actually the underinvestment in post-16 education and training that's the real issue. And unless this core fault line is repaired, we will never secure the economic and social progress that our country needs. As a true optimist, however, I am genuinely positive. I really, really do not believe that the current neglect of our sector is permanent or pervasive, and most certainly it is not personal. Firstly, it simply cannot be permanent. Government secretaries of state and chancellors are never permanent, far from it. But more importantly than the individual decision makers, the world in which we're living is changing faster than ever. And this accelerating pace of change, the advent of new technologies, changes in global trade, in economies, in demography and skill profiles, mean that the continued neglect of skills is going to very quickly create a crisis that puts the UK further behind other countries. Brexit is only going to exacerbate that situation. So our government may be being slow to respond, but the need for urgent action is becoming ever more apparent. And neither is the current state of affairs pervasive. We have, I think, very clear evidence of the growing understanding and acceptance of how serious the current underinvestment is and the impact that it's having. Not just the report I quoted earlier, but as you're all very well aware, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the Chief Inspector, the FE Commissioner, the Children's Commissioner are just some of those who've highlighted the seriousness and the risks of the current position. We have a growing consensus on the need for improved investment in colleges to secure the pipeline of skills that business needs and critically to support a more inclusive economy. And certainly the neglect that we are experiencing from Treasury is not personal. Uh, it, it's not our fault that governments have neglected FE. We may not be perfect. Mistakes are made. Sometimes our judgments are wrong. We know there's always room for improvement. We are educators after all. But we also know what our strengths are. We know that we are the sector, the sector that fuels the economy with the skills it needs. We are the sector, as we saw very clearly last night, that others fail to reach. Colleges sitting at the heart of their communities, changing lives, making a real difference. We're also the sector that is constantly adapting and responding to changing needs, dealing with the follies and the failures and the neglect of governments, rising to the challenges, continuing always to support our learners and to keep their needs at the fore. Everyone at this conference understands the importance of the work that we do. We understand the impact of this work on the lives of individuals, on our local businesses and on our communities. We know that what we do matters we know that we get it right far more often than we make mistakes. Those of you at last night's awards dinner saw very clear evidence of that. Brilliant, inspirational stories from students and fantastic example of the work in colleges that shows how innovative we are and the real impact that we have. 
the Beacon Award Colleges, shining a light on the impressive range of activities that colleges across the country do day in and day out. We heard about initiatives in technical education, in mental health and well-being, work with employers, international work, on social mobility and widening participation, on careers and guidance. These are all the things that are of critical importance to people's lives and to our nation's success and well-being. We heard about great staff and great leaders in our colleges. This is the reality. This is the day-to-day -day truth that sadly doesn't make the headlines in the press. My optimism, therefore, is not blind. It's founded on my true and deep belief in colleges on the evidence I see every day of just how precious the work we do is. There is no doubt, I think, that just like the maths teacher who couldn't teach geometry to our student, the chancellor got it very badly wrong when he failed to invest in further education. But his mistake in last month's budget will not define our sector and its future. Government has the chance to put things right, and we have the chance to help them. We must now make sure that Treasury understands, truly understands the importance of our work to improved productivity and a successful economy. Just feeling optimistic is not enough. It takes action to effect change. We are every one of us used to getting on with the job of making lives better in our own colleges and I have absolutely no doubt that we will continue to do that. But if we are going to avert the dire consequences of the continuing neglect, we must act urgently, we must act vigorously, persistently and above all I think we must act collectively to educate government and others of the critical importance of our work and the consequences of failing to support it. And your association wants to work with all of you on this shared endeavor. We are not helpless. What we choose to do and choose not to do matters. Our college mission statements vary, but at their heart, they have a common purpose and a common cause. And it's that mission and that cause which has kept us resilient, and it will continue to do so. So despite this being my final conference as chair of our association, my optimism will make sure that I continue to work on every campaign we have and use every opportunity I can to promote the college sector. It has been my greatest honor to be a part of it and to work with colleges. And we can all play our part we need to stay positive to open eyes and minds that are closed. And above all, colleagues, I urge you, we must be optimistic about our ability to really make things better and to continue to improve lives. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much. And also, thank you, Cal, for all of your hard work for the AOC as well. It's just been a fantastic job. Give her a massive round of applause, please. Um, just to reiterate what Carol was saying there, you know, I spent my life as a financial journalist talking to businesses. Uh, I worked out recently <coughs> when I was trying to push for a pay rise, uh, which I didn't get. Uh, that, if I'd have been a bloke, might have been a bit different. There we are. Uh, if, <laughs> and I was saying to the team, and I worked out that I've, I've broadcast from something like 700 businesses over the last uh, six or seven years that I've been doing the job on breakfast TV. And I just want to say, what they're always saying to me is the skills they need are the ones that you guys are delivering, which is why I'm so passionate about what you do, because I just keep thinking, why can't politicians see that the way to fill the skills gap 
is to get more money pumped to you guys so you can actually provide the skills that the companies are so desperate for. You know, they're practically like tripping over themselves to talk to me about their apprentices much more than they are their graduate trainees or whatever. That You know, businesses are often so proud of the people uh, and the colleges that they're working with on the, on the work which you do. And, and I don't think you hear enough of that. And so I just wanted to add to what Carol was saying. And the other thing I would say as well, and I do a lot of... Uh, business talks and people are always saying to me what about Brexit what you know what are businesses saying to you about their concerns the businesses doing well are the ones who are not letting the politics paralyze them they're the ones who are going right what can we control and what can we be good at and they're much more focused on technological change the disruption that might come from I don't know drones driverless cars whatever it is and so I guess that's what I want to reiterate to you is you're doing really good stuff and actually you, you, you can't control what money comes from government. And as much as we, you know, you've got to keep putting the pressure on, just please keep doing what you're doing as well because that will be, the, the sea change will come from more and more businesses demanding the, the, the skills and the training and learning you provide. Um, so I'm just going to move on to our next speaker now. This is Andrea Sleicher, who's a Director for Education and Skills and Special Advisor on Education Policy to the Secretary General of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the, the OECD. Uh, he initiated and oversees the programme for international student assessment and other international instruments which create a global platform for policy makers, researchers and educators to innovate and transform educational policies and practices. So he really does bring a global view. So please welcome to the stage Andreas Sleicher. Good morning. And I want to say it's such a privilege to be here this morning. And I'm saying this because I really believe that the future of learning is with you, the future of lifelong, life-wide learning. No? We used to learn to do the work, and now suddenly learning has become the work. And the only way that people are going to accept that one day a robot may steal their job is if they have the confidence and the skills to create or look for a new one. But we also need to think harder about, now I'm trying to get my clicker to work. Excuse me, can someone help me? <laughs> this is about technology. <laughs> yeah, now it works. We need to think harder how we develop the right skills. We need to think harder how we extract good value from the skills that people have and how we build effective skills system that cover the life course of people. No? And the one thing I don't need to explain to you is how important it is, not just for the economic success of people. We see a strong relationship between the skills of people and the earnings and employment, that's very well known, but we also see very important social outcomes related to skills that are very important for the future of our societies. No? But at the same time, the world keeps changing very fast. You know, about a decade ago, we got the world's knowledge into our fingertips. And from that moment, it didn't just matter what you know. No, Google knows everything. It mattered what you can do with what you know. And that was not the end of the story. You know, the virtual world and the real world became somehow integrated, and suddenly we were all connected. And while some things became a lot easier and simpler for us, a lot of things that we took for granted and that were actually quite simple became a lot more complicated. If you think about something like literacy in the past, literacy in the past was about extracting knowledge from books that someone else had written for you. It's a fairly straightforward task. And when you didn't know the answer to a question, you could look it up and you could trust the answer to be true. Today, you look up something on Google and you find 20,000 answers to your question and nobody tells you what's right and what's wrong. Literacy is suddenly about navigating ambiguity, managing complex information. And I just said how great it is that everybody is connected, but actually, the kind of media, social media that are around us connect you more likely with people who are like you, who think like you, who believe in the same things, who look like you. It's actually become much harder for people to embrace the diversity and views, opinions, and 
that, uh, that is around us. So actually, some things have become really, really hard for us. And if you want some data on this, so two-thirds of young Brits say they feel really, really bad if they are not connected. Being connected has become like drinking water, breathing air. The virtual world is becoming the real world for our people. So let's think about how we can develop the right skills, and that has a lot to do with anticipating where the future is going to be. It no longer works to learn once for a lifetime. The future is changing continuously, and it's basically about moving from stacking up qualifications up front in your life to this kind of lifelong, lifelong learning. Some countries are already very, very far advanced on this path, and I think you provide the right framework for this. Let's think about a bit the future of education, the future of skills. No. Think about the impact of digitalization. No. Digitalization has been incredibly democratizing. Everybody can contribute, participate, but it's also concentrating power at a rate that we have never seen before. And that's also true for education these days. It's incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard anywhere in the world. Now we know that every day. We see that every day. But it's also incredibly homogenizing, squashing individuality, cultural uniqueness. Digitalization is incredibly empowering. If you look at the largest companies these days that were created in the last decade, they were all created with an idea. They had the product before they had the money and the resources. They didn't start with a big factory. They started with an idea. But also we know that digitalization can be incredibly disempowering. Now when we start to trust algorithms and the decisions of algorithms more than we trust ourselves or our neighbors. And where you end up on that graph has a lot to do with your capacity to learn and upgrade your skills. Let's look at the effects of digitalization in a little bit more detail. Now, one of the things that we see is that routine tasks are disappearing. That's a very clear picture. Robots are taking over whole factories. But we also see that technology-intensive tasks are rapidly rising. And you put the two things together, you get a sense of where the future of work, the future of skills really, really lies. When you think about exposure, it affects some people a lot more than others. Now, you're much safer these days if you are a technician than you are a machine operator. We know that sort of the kind of skill base that you have in your occupational space have a huge influence on the volatility of your future on this. The one thing I wanted to highlight here, which I find really important, is that people are often afraid of the digital workplace in the sense, you know, it puts people at risk. But one of the things that we actually see, if, if you work in a very digital, digitalized, highly digitalized workplace, you are much more likely to keep up to date, to be, uh, become and remain a good problem solver. If you end up in a kind of least digital workplace, you are much li more likely to lose your problem solving skills that you had initially after graduating. So actually, Digitalization is a great way to keep people up to date. Now, it's also something that makes people to read more, to do more writing, to do more numeracy at work. Now, those skills are highly related to the nature of our workplace. And interestingly, it also makes us more likely to learn from our coworkers, to learn by doing, to keeping up to date. So in a way, the digital workplace is a counterpart of the FE colleges these days integrating these two worlds, the world of learning and the world of work, is where the future lies, and that is to do with these kinds of digital workplaces. Now, the last point I want to add to this is that the, it's basic, basically about the global value chains around us. Now, the more interconnected our economies become, the less money we make in the kind of production stage, and the more money we are going to make in the pre-production stage, now, the R&D, the design phases, and then the post-production, the service, and the marketing of things. So that's ex exactly also one of the things that when we design the future of learning, we need to keep in mind. And the more integrated economies become, the more U-shaped that curve really becomes. Let's see how well we are prepared for this. One of the things that we did is we assessed the digital problem-solving skills of adults. And these were not abstract you know, programming skills, but really very practical capacities of people to use digital technologies. And you can see, basically, when you look among older workers, 55 to 65-year-olds, 
doesn't look very good. Now, there are a lot of skill shortages in these kinds of technology. The UK is actually well positioned, at least better positioned than many other countries, but you still only talk about one in five older workers who are prepared for the flat world in which we live today. Not tomorrow, this is today's reality. And now you're gonna tell me, well, that's all solved. You know, young people are digital natives. They have all of those kinds of skills from you know, birth. But actually, when you look at 16 or 24 year olds, yeah, the picture does look better. But you still talk about you know, just 40% of the people prepared for the world in which we live today. And actually, while the UK used to be at the top of the league in the older generation, in the younger generation, the UK is more at the bottom of the league. And not because things got worse, absolutely not, but because things got so much faster elsewhere in the world. If you look to Singapore, for example, now there are very few people in the old generation have the skills to contribute to the flat world. But actually, among young people, it's two thirds. That is possible, and that is about investing in the skills of people continuously across the life cycle of people. That brings me to the second point. How do we foster learning through our lives? And the learning is actually the easy part. What is much harder for all of us is to unlearn and relearn when the context changes. No? To give up some of our habits, our, the kind of things that we got used to, our ways of thinking that have been very established. No? Being open to the novelty, being open to new types of thinking, new types of working, that is the test of truth. And that requires not just the capacity, but also the willingness to keep learning throughout life, the belief that learning is gonna transform our lives. And I just wanna show you one thing here that I find really important. When I look at universities in the UK, and I look at workers who are well matched to their jobs, that's the green bar, they have decent skills. No? But there are a lot of people in the UK who work in jobs for which they wouldn't need a higher education degree. No? And now some people say, well, they're just unlucky people. They got great skills, but they got a job that isn't using their skills. No. Actually, if you look at the blue bar here, what it tells you is a very different story. It tells you actually that those people that actually got a university degree, but end up in jobs that don't require one, actually don't have the skills. Somehow they got a batch, a degree, a credential, but actually, when you look inside the package, actually the skills value isn't there. And that, I think, is one of the big dilemmas that we have. We have a lot of credentialism. We have the trust in kind of degrees and qualifications. But as soon as we look at the actual skills that people have, the picture can be very, very different. And actually, what we did in the past, you know, building that trust in degrees, will not work in the future. Employers are becoming much, much better to figure out what skills you actually have right now rather than trusting a degree that you've got you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So this chart, I think, is a really warning signal that we're not doing so well, and we need to do better to integrate the world of work and the world of learning. If you think about the world of learning, the traditional university sector, now one of the things that we see, and this is not a picture of the UK, Jess, we see that all around the industrialized world, that more and more people are leaving with degrees, having difficulties finding adequate jobs, and at the same time, employers are quite desperate to find the people with the skills they need. There is this growing kind of mismatch. We also see that there are plenty of people in many countries who've got a degree who don't have the skills that you would associate with this degree. And again, the UK is not alone. That is a general phenomenon, the mismatch between formal qualification and actual skills of people. So, one of the effects that we see is actually those kinds of degrees and qualifications that exist are segmenting labor markets. They make people believe in certain currencies that actually don't have, have the purchasing power they suggest. But even worse, narrow, in a, in a way, you can take England as a good example. Now, the system is heavily biased towards the traditional universities. And the entrance exams to universities actually are distorting almost all of the system basically to schools. Now, that's actually one of the risks that we currently have. We also have a very lumpy degree structure, now, and that discourages people from learning through our life. If all what matters is a formal degree that you can only get in three years, why would I invest in something that is more granular? But it is changing. If you go to Sweden, if you go to Finland these days, learning has become very granular, very modular. People decide where they learn, what they learn, how they learn when they learn throughout their lives. 
40% of the adult workforce in Sweden is participating in sustained learning that is not just narrowly job-based, but that can be well for their next job. So this is one of the things we need to consider. Now, I don't say that university degrees are going uh, away. They are going to be a very important currency. But we see more of employer-driven and skill-based certification all around the world. And the better technology becomes, the easier it will be for employers to actually see the skills that people have got. No? and to build those skill systems in a much more granular way. And I think that's actually where your market, the FE College, is, is so strong. No? So it's the future is about engaging employers and no? bringing them really into the learning system. No? And I know that's very, very hard to do for small enterprises, no? which are dominating the UK labor market. But they're good examples. If you look, for example, to Norway, a small enterprises partner, and they partner with institutions. They build frameworks that can actually share the costs and complexities of apprenticeship programs. Or do you take Switzerland, where actually companies are sharing apprentices? Right? They are small, they work together to build those kinds of systems. So there are solutions to this problem. It's also about integrating work based learning more systematically into vocational and also technical education. And this is an area where I think you could probably do more. Now, the work-based learning part is a really, really important part of the learning part. And in one way, we think it should almost be mandatory. You have a significant share of learning at the workplace. Now, it is best if it's systematic, credit-bearing, quality-assured. That's very important. And also, it's something that uh, will sustain itself financially. The cost are very different. Now you can make a lot of money out of training an electrician as an apprentice. You lose money by training an electronics you know, engineer. And the reasons are very obvious. But it, it suggests that governments need to think much harder how they subsidize continual learning so that it works for employers, for individuals, and for everyone. Employers are also actually quite good in telling you about the evolution of skill demand. No? They're not as good as you might think in the long run, no? but they're very good in showing you how skills are being used today. What is also, in my view, really important, I say this, I think in the UK, uh, it's important to build a sufficient degree of transversal skills into continual learning. No? A lot of learning in New York country is very short, very job specific, very occupationally oriented. But today the transversal skill component is the most important part that helps people move forward. So I think this is something really to work on. And then think about, you know, what can governments do about this? And finding the right match, ensure that the provision is aligned with the evolution of skill demand to also ensure that there is a high degree of quality in the delivery. Now, quality assurance is a real issue about. And also to ensure that we do have a currency that there are reliable competency-based qualifications. Qualifications that don't tell us you know, what we have learned in content, but they are good signals of what people can actually do. No? Career guidance. Now, telling young people more of the truth is really, really important. No? And doing this early on. I show you sort of a picture about 15-year-olds. We asked them about their career expectation at the age of 15 in the PISA study. And one of the things that we see is that young people who have higher career expectations, who have a broader view of the world, who know more of the opportunities in the future, are much more likely to end up in a skilled occupation. And I know now you're going to tell me, well, that's obvious because, you know, those people have higher expectations because they have better skills, have more wealthy homes, and so on. But even when you discount for all of this, actually the ideas that young people have about their future early on remains a very, very strong predictor for what they do. So bringing the world of work much earlier into the world of learning is really, really important to give particularly disadvantaged children a good picture of this. Now, creating a coherent guidance profession, ensuring that guidance is adequately supported. And actually, at the age of 16 or 18, it's very, very late in the stage of people's lives. Now, those things really need to happen very, very early on. I'm not going to talk about the need to extract good value from skills. That's actually one of the things where I believe the UK is quite good. Your employer is actually quite good in figuring out what skills people have, irrespective of their degrees and qualifications. You could see that in the chart. No? I want to just sum up how important it is to build all of this into coherent skill system. These things are all easy to talk about, but really, really hard to do in practice. No? 
because our systems are all poorly aligned. Now, there's a higher education world, an FV world, continual learning, work-based learning, and those things here in the UK are not very well integrated. Now, it's not Switzerland where you can see all of these pathways somehow seemingly seamlessly work together, or in the Netherlands or Germany, but I think there are a lot of challenges for making this work. But if you do want to make it work, it's about starting very, very early. Young people's beliefs, young people's capacities in schooling are crucial determinant for their future success. It's about making learning everybody's business, you know, giving people much more discretion over how they learn, where they learn, when they learn, bring employers on board, government, people on this. You know. And then again, we used to learn to do the work. Now learning is the work for us every day. That's the test of truth for anyone in any situation. So. And that means we need to allow to adapt learning to the lives of people rather than trying to put people in an educational institutions. So making learning provision much more flexible, much more responsive to the needs of people. So. Also being better in identifying those who need the learning most. That's really hard because as institutions, we are naturally inclined to sort of serve those who are best prepared, who have survived the kind of schooling system, but actually the rate of return is highest for those who need that most. Improving transparency, you know, giving people a good signal of the truth is important. And the last point is really about guidance. It is a tough agenda. Now, I don't think there's any question about it that this is really, really hard, but that's what the future really requires of us. And I do think you as FE colleges are the right starting point for this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andres. I mean, it, there's so much there that will resonate so well with this audience, the sense of how important the work is that they're doing. But how can you make the people, like the politicians or whatever, listen to how important it is globally and how important it is for business and things because that's what the big struggle is. Yeah, you know, I, I think actually most politicians do understand this agenda quite well. Uh, they work in an environment where you have a very strong lobby that is very much dominated by traditional providers. I think that's true not just in the UK but everywhere. I think in a way your system is heavily biased towards those institutions. Now, most people who run your country come from those yeah, kinds exactly. of institutions. Yeah. So, but I, I think sort of the ag agenda is understood. I also think it's not just about a government, it's also about helping people to understand that they need to invest in a lifelong, life-wide learning, that it's actually less and less useful to stack up qualifications at the beginning, that actually this idea of, and I think that's, that's the hard part. Mm. You, know, you can solve the provision, the supply of learning, the shaping the demand for learning and giving people the signals through qualification systems that are much more granular. The, the first thing employers, I mean, you can put more money into institutions, but the first thing actually to do is making the qualification systems much more granular. Yeah. So in other words, the more people actually go and use the further education yeah. system, then that will dictate where it goes. I, I do believe so. I, I think also um, ensuring that the quality of provision is, is really, really good and making it an attractive first choice of people, I think is very important. Well, which other countries do you think we could learn from here? Well, if you look at the countries doing that best, the Nordic countries in Europe, uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, are doing really well in, in, in integrating the world of work and learning. Basically, employers are willing to give you time, governments are making the necessary investments, and people somehow see this as a way to progress beyond the current job. There's a lot of investment in the next job, not just in the current job, like here in the UK. So I think that you can learn from there. I think when you look at the integration of, of work, the work-based learning part, Switzerland, Germany, Austria are very good at this. Denmark has become very good at this. Singapore has become very good at this. It's also important because many people say these are countries that had a long tradition of doing this, but there are actually some new emerging uh, countries that are, have become very and, good. And they, is, they, do they have a completely different frame of mind about FE? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, there are two things that are different. First of all, governments see this as a first choice for people. They are making this a very prestigious choice. In fact, in, in, in my country, in Germany, the majority of young people goes to those kinds of colleges as opposed to university, despite the fact that university is free. They actually pay you for going to university. Still, most people think that's the right pathway for me. I also think employers are really willing to invest in the work-based part, and I, I, I do believe it's a crucial part of learning. FE learning doesn't work when you don't have also a counterpart at the workplace, you know, where basically 
there is high quality provision where you have people in the workplace who are well trained in pedagogy and when you have people in the FE college who is, have you know, up-to-date skills, who are actually also, this is, the, I think, a big part that we face here is that when you look at the pay, you know, it pays you better to be a plumber as a plumber than to be a plumber in an FE college. And that, I think, is a real, real problem. You want to have the best people in mm. your colleges. Yeah, yeah, which is tricky when the funding sort of. Andreas, yeah. <coughs> thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. Put your hands together for thank you. Andreas Light. Thank you. Thank you. It's fascinating, isn't it, when you hear about how it's been done in other countries and you just think, why aren't we doing that here as well? And why aren't they listening to us? Uh, so, obviously, a lot of this centres around the, the people that you're actually teaching, the learners. And once again, we've got a number of students here gaining work experience and everything from event management. We've got guys from Newcastle College and Sheffield College here. Journalism students from Grimsby College, who I got the pleasure of meeting yesterday. And also all the catering and hospitality students, too, who are, uh, are working with us. So all of this, you know, it, it, it's, it's about them, isn't it? Just as much as anything else. So I just want to play you a little video before we bring on our next speaker, uh, which is the, the Student of the Year video. It feels amazing, really good. Didn't think I'd get this far. It's really good. I feel shocked because I wasn't expected to be nominated, let alone win. So it feels really good. Amazing, to be honest, when there's so many other good candidates out there as well. in life, it helps you to gain skills that you know you can use to help others as well. Bring out my confidence and do different activities that help the community. Passionate about something and you work hard it pays off. The reason I love teaching BTEC is because it's all about giving learners the knowledge, skills and experience for career success, whatever path they choose. In summer 2019, we'll celebrate outstanding BTEC students, teachers, schools, colleges and training providers from around the world at the 9th Annual BTEC Awards. So this is your chance to nominate your BTEC stars. really important because it showcases the diversity of the people doing BTEC. Nominations are now open for 2019. It's easier than ever to enter. There are more chances to recognise outstanding students and great teaching. And there'll be everyone from business leaders to Olympic champions cheering you on. So celebrate your BTEC stars and submit your nomination today. I'm sorry I keep inflicting me going on in that VT as well. I've seen it about 10 times now and every time I'm like, oh, who is she? She's awful. Right, our next speaker uh, was described by the Financial Times as a leading revolutionary. My mic's gone again, hasn't it? Uh, a professor at the School of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Henley Business School, founder and learning director of Pentacle, a virtual business school, and a leading business theorist, inventor, innovator and educator. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Eddie Orbeng. Hello, hi. Um, I'm so happy to be here and I do apologize for the shirt. But as you know, professors' salaries are going down and uh, I have to rush straight from here to my uh, part-time job at EasyJet. So. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, let me just uh, tell you what happened when I was asked to speak at this conference. I had a very fascinating and quite amusing moment. 
Um, my business manager said, oh, you've been invited to speak at the AOC conference. Sorry, this is a bit further back than it should be, but so I might walk backwards and forwards, but please don't be distracted by that. She said, uh, she said uh, this, you've been invited to speak at the AOC conference. I said, oh, that sounds exciting. So guess what? I Googled it, as one does, okay? And when I Googled it, uh, what I found was, um, was this. Uh, let's, let's just see. Okay, I don't know whether you can see this purple thing in the, in the distance. Let's get a bit closer to it. Okay, and Association Academy of Chocolate. <laughs> so of course I said yes! <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I, I know that you had a, a fascinating evening last night and um, we've got a good close to the conference. Um, you heard the introduction about me. Uh, I, you've probably come across me from uh, CUBE, my virtual business school environment, which is why I'm in here, or maybe from my TED Talks and things like that. But what I wanted to do was I wanted us to have an interactive session, if that's okay with you. So I'll try again. I wanted us to have an interactive session, if that's okay with you. Okay, great, okay. So we're gonna have an interactive session, and what I want to do is I'll give you the, the sort of the, uh, I'll spoil the plot. There are four things I want you to walk away with in terms of this, sorry, I have to keep walking backwards, so I'll get faster and faster as I go. In terms of this challenge of uh, how we're going to make absolutely certain that we, um, we can lead we can lead all the change we want. And there we go. Okay. Yeah? So the first one is I want you to focus on curiosity. And when you leave here, if the word curiosity isn't stamped on your forehead, I've, I've made a mistake. I've done something wrong. The second one I want you to focus on is connection. Connection is how we lead in a fast-changing world. The third one is about change. Change doesn't work the same way as it used to. And I want to highlight that for you. And the final one is this whole area of courage which sounds like a funny thing to say. So those are the spoilers. That's what I'm going to try and focus you on. I'm going to sneak them into the presentation, okay? But since it's an interactive session, I want you to imagine the next 20 odd minutes is fantastic. You learn how to move your organizations, how to make further education a continuous life learning process, how to execute, how to get academics to change. I don't know what it is. What is it which if you learned in the next 20 or so minutes would make it the best 20 minutes of the whole conference? No push some pressure on me. What would make you the best 20 minutes of your whole life in terms of learning? Okay, unlikely but possible. You know there's some strange people out there. So that's question one. Please, in twos or threes next to each other, quick conversation about what would make it the best possible thing and also a quick conversation about what I shouldn't do. What would make it the worst? What are your greatest fears? So I need your biggest hopes, your biggest fears. You've got 30 seconds max. I'm going to collect the top four or five and we'll build a joint presentation together. Yeah? Okay, over to you. Your time has started. Your seconds are ticking. Go. About five seconds left. Okay, let's, uh, oops, something's gone funny with my system. That's okay, great. So, where do we start? Do we start with the hopes or do we start with the fears? What would you like to start with? Hopes? Now, this is where it gets interesting. Um, I was scared when they moved the computer around that they would break everything, and I think they have. Yep, they've broken it. Uh, <laughs> I did warn them, they didn't believe me. I'm going to have to adapt. Adapt and overcome. That's never good, is it? That's never, ever, ever good. Okay, uh, yep, they did break it. Let me try again. If it works, great. If not, so you, can't, you start shouting whilst I, whilst I try and fix this. Not a good idea. It's not going to work. I'm sorry, it's broken. Okay, let's not panic. There is, these things happen. Uh, yeah, I knew it would happen, and it did. Okay, so, shout, I'll learn, I'll talk, I'll write. I can't write, so I'll have to describe things. Sorry about that, guys. But just go for it. So what, what is it you really want me to cover? Just tell me, and I'll go with it. Any hopes? <laughs> Any hopes? 
how to influence government to fund FE properly. Yeah, and another one? Just give me quickly. I missed that? How to reach young people. Okay, any fears, anything you don't want me to spend time on? <laughs> Brexit, okay, and one more? Sorry, you, you don't want to patronize me to patronize you, insult you, or be late. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. I, I won't talk down to you, I promise. Actually, it's hard. You're higher than I am. Okay, great. So, let's, uh, let's make a start. Um, this, is, this is where you discover how versatile you are as a presenter, isn't it? You suddenly discover whether or not you can actually present without your preparation. So, let's go with it. Um, where I'd like to start then is I want to build a big picture about what's going on. I want to focus on the how of making things happen. Uh, I'll have to just describe things because I can't illustrate them uh, properly, but I'll do my best. First place I'd like to start then is um, just setting context of the world we're in. You heard from Andreas earlier about one of the challenges being the pace of change and the complexity. I had a funny experience. I, had, um, I, had a, I went to a, a conference by Gartner. And there was a futurist talking about the future. And he was saying, well, in 2050, this is what's going to be happening. And the world's going to be growing, blah, 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 et cetera. And he was describing how you wake up in the morning extra early because your computer had woken you up. And having been woken up extra early by your computer, what would happen then is that it would then make sure that the right food was ready for you because the Internet of Things would have worked out what eggs you need. And then as you're going to the train station, uh, as you're approaching the train, it knows you're coming. So the net result of that is they add extra train carriages on, and while you're in the train doing your work, your office knows it's coming, so it opens the windows, closes the windows. He's describing all these wonderful things, and then he says, and finishes off the whole conversation, there are about 1,000 people in this room. He says, and then you go into the office, and you go to your meeting. And I went, ha, 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 and I was the only person, 1,000 people. <laughs> you, you, you get the joke, though, don't you? You do all that technology to go to a meeting. You could have done that anyway, couldn't you? You don't need all that technology to go to a meeting. Why was this guy who was a futurist talking about going to a meeting? I'll let you in on the secret. The secret is very simple. He's stuck in his formatting. Everyone here, I assume, is older than Google. 1998 was when Google started. Do you understand what that means? It means that you have a previous formatting which is not designed for the world we're in. In other words, I'm not supposed to talk down to you, am I? In other words, you're doomed. So that's not talking down. That's, that's just misery, okay? So. Why is that? I'll try and explain. You see, we were formatted a certain way. I'll try and describe some of these elements and why it makes it so difficult for us to be curious, to be able to actually connect to each other and stuff. When we were at school, you were the good guys. You were the smart kids. You were the ones who have made it to the top. Am I right? Therefore, you were good at doing things like learning, putting in your head, learn and put in your head. That's what we were supposed to do. So we learned how to rely on ourselves, and we learned how to learn, and we learned all the patterns we were supposed to. And remember, every pattern you learn sets the next pattern. That's part of your formatting. And one of the patterns we learned was, you must make sure that you know what you're talking about. Facts are important. Facts are things which go in your head. You remember that stuff? There were other kids at school. They did something slightly different from us. They did this thing called collaborative learning. Do you remember? And the teachers didn't approve of it, and they called it cheating. Do you remember? So therefore, in your value set, you believe that collaborating with people somehow is not really right. So you'll say the words, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's coming from your heart. Do you understand how we're formatted? And then we're formatted worse than that, because I'll find you another slide. I'm making this up as I go along. You probably work that out. Um, I'll find you another slide. Let's find this one here. Oh, come on. Don't do this to me. I'm a nice person. High network delay, voice chat suspended. So the internet has gone on strike on me as well. <laughs> oh, there you go. OK, so, so let's look at this one for a second. Um, so this one is a, a funny diagram because it starts, um, it starts basically, uh, where does it start? It starts where it says, I have a high workload. Let's find the mouse. There you go. There's my mouse. OK, and um, the net result is it says, I have a high workload. OK, there. Um, and the net result of that is, I don't have enough time to plan or to do or to be creative. You got that? So the net result of that is I don't realize how much work I'm committed to and I've already done half. Net result of that is, therefore, that I say yes more than is realistic, which, of course, then pushes my workload even higher. You got that? Now, if you were curious people, you'd ask me, how are you doing that? Wouldn't you? But you didn't ask me. Why is that? Because part of our formatting is to demonstrate that we know what's going on. Do you understand how dangerous this is? In a fast-changing world, you're going to tell people you know what's going on. 
no, it's not going to work. On this particular diagram, the high workload means we have no time to plan to be creative or curious. Net result is sometimes we come close to things other people think are important. Net result is that other people are keen to reach their goals. So guess what? They interrupt us. So I spend a lot of my time starting half-done jobs, pushing my workload higher, giving me less time to plan or to do things. Therefore, people know I'm, I'm, uh, uh, they can interrupt me and get away with it. And it goes round and round. Have you seen this happening to your colleagues at work? Not you, though. <laughs> How could I know your lives before I met you? I know your lives before I met you because we're all in the same mess together. Something very simple has happened over the past 20, 30 years. And I'll describe it and then you'll understand. If I take as the starting point now, okay, and then I think about the past. So let's say now is, let's pretend that where I'm standing here is, ooh, 2018. And let's go back in time to, I don't know, uh, 2018, 20, 2008, 1998. Can everyone remember that far back? Okay. So 1998, the world is changing. Can you remember that far back? Okay, the world is changing. Can you do use your fingers to tell me how the world is changing as I move through time? Is it going up or down? Or how, how is the world changing? Is it going? It's going up, higher, higher, slowing down. The world slows down sometimes. <laughs> down? So the world went faster, faster, and slowed down. Is that right? No, the world just accelerates. Am I right? It just keeps accelerating. Why? Because there are more people on the planet, they're all connected, we're using technology, we're all after change, it just accelerates, not interesting. What is interesting is how fast are we learning and changing over the same period? It's a bit flat, isn't it? Do you understand? Once upon a time, we could learn faster than the world was changing. We had these things called textbooks, do you remember? You with me? When you were running your organizations, you had these things called budgets, which made some sense, do you remember? You could plan them, they'd work for about six to nine months. You remember? We move to today. Pace is faster, the information's changing, the knowledge base is changing, and two other things have happened. As our world accelerates, it hits us as human beings, bang, in the middle of our heads. Why? Because we're human beings. Human beings are not designed for change. If you don't remember, if you don't believe me, think about it. Four and a half million years ago, if you went around the AOC conference, you didn't find people with sophisticated job descriptions like, I don't know, head of college. No, they only had two job descriptions, which were what? Hunters and gatherers. Am I right? If you say goodbye to your other half in the morning, goodbye, darling, where are you going? I'm going hunting and gathering. What do they do? Do they just wave you off and say, bring some uh, milk when you're coming back? Or do they give you a massive hug? Massive hug, why? You might not come back, why? Because all the other animals also do hunting and gathering. <laughs> and the other animals are better animals than you. Usain Bolt used to be the fastest man on the planet, could run at 26 miles an hour, after doing all his exercise and years of training for his Olympics, 26 miles an hour, the average rabbit, 32 miles an hour. No press-ups. Do <laughs> you understand? You were going to get eaten. So how come we're the top predator on the planet? How did we get here? Very simply, what happened was we got saved by something. What? When you read the textbooks, they'll tell you things like people use their big intellect and their ability to communicate and working together in tribes. They'll tell you all this stuff. It's not true. Think about it. We're out hunting and gathering. Out of the bushes burst a saber-toothed tiger, bounding towards you, looking hungry. Okay? Concepts like opposable thumbs are not going to stop, save you because when you go stop, they don't stop. You with me? They bound towards you. If you switch on your brain and start to use thinking processes, I'm going to think about it. Well, let's discuss it. Let's have a strategic meeting. You're going to get eaten. <laughs> so how can we survive? We survive because a little thing in the back of your neck here kicked in. What does it do? It says, oh, my goodness, I'm a human being. I'm a rubbish animal. Therefore, any change I see is a threat to my security. Net result of that is I have to survive. It does three fast things. First, most important thing is it switches off your logical brain. The front bit has to go. It literally cuts the blood flow. Why? Because thinking will always be too slow. Then, on top of that, it fills you full of fear. Why emotion? Because when you're emotional, you're in the moment. I never met anyone who said, I'm going to be to my table two times. I've got conference call at three. You don't do that. <laughs> then you got your adrenaline and you fought, uh, f uh, went into your fighting or, or fleeing. Why is this important? Because we still have that software in our necks today. Do you understand why fake news works? Do you understand why it's a post-truth world? It's not because you guys have stopped doing research. It's because the people receiving the information are in an emotional state. And logic cannot penetrate an emotional state. If you don't believe me, think about it. The next time you have a discussion with your other half, and they say, you don't really love me. You say, yes, I do. I can prove it logically. I remembered your birthday. I brought you tea in bed. See how that goes. But don't email me to let me know. <laughs> So what's happened is as we've gone from 1998, where we could learn fast and the world was changing, 
the learning pace has stayed roughly the same, whilst at the same time the change has whooshed past it to 2018, where the pace of change outstrips our ability to learn. Plus, it makes us scared because so many new things are coming at us that it turns off our brains, that we immediately go to the headline, which is the most shocking, that it's hard to actually absorb information. Do you see where we are? And so that is the world you are trying to lead change in. It's not an easy world, but you're trying to lead change from a position, which I was trying to escape, explain, where you've been formatted to assume that there are correct answers, for example. Some of you will be evaluating what I'm saying, and this will be what's going through your head. Well, if he's saying what I'm, I, I think already, then he must be right. We both agree. Eddie just said something about saber tooth. I'm not so sure about that. Well, if he's right, I must be wrong, and I'm not wrong, therefore he must be wrong. Can you hear those voices in your head? That's how we're trained. We're formatted to evaluate stuff like that. Now, of course, that sounds great in a world where you can learn fast, the world is changing, but it makes certain mistakes. In the new world, it's possible that not only are you wrong, but I'm wrong as well. But that doesn't enter our sphere. I'm going to stop at that point. So if I've done a good job so far, I've started to make you curious about what's actually going on. Am I right? OK. So the way I was moving the mouse earlier was I have something called a Mayo on my arm. Sorry, the internet is also letting me down. Um, so we'll just have to go with it. Um, I have something on my arm called a Mayo. It reads the signals in your arm, and it translates those into my mouse. That was how I was doing it. This is old technology. It's about four or five years old. Interesting, isn't it? You've heard about artificial intelligence, for example, I'm sure. Now, I work with corporate clients. You guys work with students. Our education is different. You give them degrees. They have to behave. They have to listen to you. We can't give them degrees. It's executive education. So if they don't like it, they can be really rude to you and get away with it, OK? So what's fascinating is for the clients I work with, when they look at things like skills gaps, you're thinking about how do we plug the skills gap? How do we get investment from government to plug the skills gaps? How do we get the young people to the areas they want? That's what you're thinking. Do you know what many of the employee, uh, employers who I work with think strategically? They just see it as a problem. Their problem is they don't have the skills. They have two options. They can either skill people up, or they can take away the skills from the human beings. Two options. They're going to choose one or the other. In skilling people up, that's what we want. But they haven't got the time to skill people up. So they think of other ways of doing it. They go, can I use AI to get a normal person to be a super salesperson by having a little earpiece in their ear, which tells them what questions to ask? You with me? So I don't train them and then put them into the job. I guide them on the job. I enhance the person in their role. Then the other one they're thinking is, well, maybe we could just get the technology to do all of it. So that's your market competition. Your competition is no longer the education sector. Your competition is everything else which provides answers to people in real time. So when you ask me how do we persuade the government to invest more, I, I can tell you techniques for ninja techniques for getting people to agree and stuff. But there's another angle, which is, if we can't get investment, how do we innovate? And the question is, what's the innovation we then want to lead? I think you've spent the conference talking about some of the innovations you want to lead, like lifelong learning, like making sure people get the learning. We've just started to support people through things like the pr apprentice program because I have Cube, so I can, I can actually do that. The reason companies don't buy into the apprentice program is because they have people in teams. And if you take one of the people out of the team to train them, the level of disruption costs more than just paying the apprentice fee. Do, do you understand? So what we do is we say, we've got a virtual world. They'll stay in their office. They'll stay at their desktop. They'll have an avatar, and they'll be in connection with everyone else. There, you see, you didn't get the, 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 the interaction and the, the disruption. So that's where I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds just to talk to each other, and then I want to move on to the next thing, which is connection. If I've done a good job, you're starting to think differently about the way the world works. Have I done a good job? Hands up. Some hands going up. Good, OK. So just a, a second, just talk to the person you spoke to about the hopes and fears. Yeah, I like it, no, I don't, et cetera. Please, over to you, just one second.
Okay. Okay, let's look at connection. The second thing which messes up our formatting, okay, apart from the curiosity, the fact that we want to ensure that we know everything, is our ability to connect. Uh, for this, I need a good looking assistant. Uh, I think it's, uh, oh, it's you, sir. <laughs> Can you be my good looking assistant? I just need you up here. Applause for my good looking assistant. Just high speed. Okay, while he's coming up here, so while he's coming up here, I just want you to promise me that I'm going to do something which might be a bit noisy. When I ask you to keep the noise down so I can give you the next instruction, please go quiet quickly, otherwise it will take too long. Is that, is that a deal? Okay, great. Connection. This is our problem for us, us people who are formatted. Thank you, good looking assistants. Great. Okay, so what we're going to do is, we're going to, I'm going to teach you how to count to three. Okay? Some titters in the audience. Okay? <laughs> So make sure you're in a pair. So check, check either side. Make sure you're in a pair. Pair, 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 pair. So not, three is not a pair. So look at the other person. You and me. You and me. Okay. Pair, 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 pair. Everyone in a pair? Is everyone in a pair? Anyone not in a pair? Make sure in a, maybe even behind you. Great. Cool. Okay. So we're going to count to three, but we're going to do it collaboratively. It'll work like this. I'll say one, then you say two, then I'll say three, then one, two, three. And we'll go as fast as we can. So please stand up and let's go as fast as we can. Stand up. Go as fast as we can. One, two, three. One, two, three, one, one, two. Three. <laughs> yeah, watch them, they can't do it either. <laughs> they can't do it. <laughs> Pathetic. I'll give them a couple more seconds. <laughs> stop! Pathetic! Stop, stop! Look, I'll make it easier for you. Forget the number one. One, can you remember? Forget the number one. Replace the number one with a click. So it goes click two, three, click two, three. As fast as you can. Try it and see. Two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Two, three. <laughs> Stop! Rubbish! Can you remember the number three? I beg you, just remember three, okay? Replace click, with one with click, two with a clap, and then three. As fast as you can. Go. Three. 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 Oh, not bad. Watch it. <laughs> Rubbish! Stop embarrassing! Look, forget the numbers. Numbers are far too advanced for you guys. I thought you run colleges. Look, click for the one, click, then clap, then slap your thigh as fast as you can. Go and let's see what you get. So go, go for it. <laughs> Pathetic! Stop! Stop! Can you, last round, last round. Can you go back to doing that one, two, three and see what's happened to you? Just go back to one, two, three and let's see what's happened to you. Try one, two, three, one. Two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One. one. You're much better. <laughs> Congratulations, applaud yourselves and my good looking assistants. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay, can, <laughs> can anyone explain to me what happened there? Can anyone explain to me what happened there? Why couldn't you count to three? It's your formatting, okay? If you're older than Google, you believe certain things. You believe that the knowledge should be in your head. You believe that you must present yourself as part of the package. So you're always in output mode. So when I say count to three, you go, knowledge, I know that. One, two, three, ha, <laughs> it is an idiot, okay? That's what went through your head, okay? But you didn't know I was going to get you to do it collaboratively with connection with the other person. So I got my good looking assistant, I demonstrated it, and then you stood up to do it. And you went, well, one, two, three, I can do that. But you stood in your pair, slightly awkward, am I right? And uh, who, you see, you did the polite, well, do you want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> and so you go, oh, all right, then I'll go first. And you went, one, with a perfect one. And you were so pleased with yourself, you were going, yay, okay? You're not listening to the other person. They're now worried, because you've gone, in fact, they're a bit fed up, because they wanted to go first. So. They splutter too, but they got it, so they're so happy with themselves. You're not listening to them, they're not listening to you. You go, swap to two, wah, wah. and then I got you to relax, and I got you to laugh together, and as you laughed and looked into each other's eyes, you made the connection. 
And when you made the connection, when I went back to one, two, three, you were no longer thinking about yourself, the big I am. You were no longer presenting the fact you knew not, had knowledge and could show it off. All of a sudden, you were, e were able to do it easily. Am I right? Okay. You understand why I wanted us to have an interactive session? Because we all go out and say we must listen to the learners. We all go out and say we must make it participant-centered. We must make it employer-centered. And then we talk at people. It's really hard for us because that's how we're formatted. The rule is this. The courage rule is this. If you're doing something and you're comfortable with it, it's probably either pointless or obsolete. That is the rule. <laughs> you with me? So if you think about my experience just now, I had prepared a presentation, which then blew up. So I had to invent it. And for a few seconds, I thought, oh, this is really bad. And then I thought, opportunity for a new session. And it takes me a while, because I'm also an oldie. So we understand that. The courage piece is really crucial. Go where the fear is. If you don't do digital, spend your time doing digital. I'll give you an example. The problem with digital is they hoax us a lot with a lot of, uh, I can't move because the internet won't let me. Um, I would have shown you, but let me, let me just, I'll describe it verbally. Have you seen those pictures of drones delivering pizza? Everyone seen that? Okay, so drones delivering pizza. What do you think? Does it make sense? It's a hoax. What they're relying on is, remember, pace of change slow, people understanding, pace of change speeding up, people's learning, falling behind. They're assuming that they can tell you stories, but you don't understand them. I was a teenager once. Pizza flying over my house had a special name. It was called Free Pizza. <laughs> you know, the idea of a drone or an uh, 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 autonomous car driving through central London. Nobody knows what's inside. ISIS still exists, by the way. It's not going to happen. Are you with me? And if it does, it just takes one explosion, and we go, oh, my goodness. Is it wise to let things just wander through our cities? Do you get it? These are hoaxes. They told you that learning should be everywhere. It should be mobile. Do you remember that? And they tried to persuade us to produce all these mobile learning apps. Have you ever tried learning? Do you know how hard it is? I mean, so learning is hard, and now I'm going to sit on a noisy tube train and learn. No, of course not. Do you understand? So one of the things which is also really quite crucial is this necessary uh, need to actually take the courage to go against the grain. Most of what you hear directly is marketing. You have to step back, find out what your people really want through your connections, and then deliver it. So the last thing I'm going to comment on is about change. And in terms of change, yes, I do. OK, in terms of change, um, there's just one element which I'd like to pick up, which is change isn't the same as it used to be. Traditionally, because we could learn fast, the world was changing. If something new came along, we had time to understand it and learn and work it out. I would call that painting by numbers, like those books we used to have as kids. You follow the structure, you follow the pattern, and all is good. Am I still blowing up? I'll, I'll, find, a, yeah, I'll, find, I'll find a nicer. Uh, yeah, we're not going to get there. These things happen. Yeah, so, um, yeah, just put the video on me, because that's not going to happen. We broke it when we moved it. It's, it's done. OK. Yeah, so, um, so that's that end of the spectrum. As you move away and the world starts moving faster, sometimes you know what you're going to do. Sometimes you know how you're going to do it, and you start to work. We, we must get more foreign students. You get a goal, and you try and work towards it. Have you got that? And then you move towards today, where you know something should be done. It should have been done yesterday. It needs fees and funds you don't have. It needs to be done fast, but you're not sure what it is. This is what I call foggy change. That end is very structured. This end is very unstructured. The feeling you should get in your gut is at this end, you should feel comfortable, not requiring any courage. And at this end, you should feel quite panicky and scared. If you are doing and working on stuff which doesn't make you feel panicky and scared, you're working on the wrong stuff. The way you walk through the fog is the way you lead people through that change. Job number one, no one will follow you through the fog if they don't trust you. So you've got to build trust. The way you build trust is very easy. You promise to do something, something small. You do it. You remind them you promised you were going to do it, and you've done it. And this works with everyone. Four cycles and they start to trust you and believe you. Do it four times on four different things very quickly. Trust is crucial. Second, one step at a time. Third, get them to dream the end game, and then get them to talk about how they got there in the past tense. When people imagine something which is coming, they form a, an attachment to it, and they believe it can happen. So in change and leading change, those are the elements you need. So if I've done a good job, you're going to go away from here curious, trying to find out more stuff, trying to find out how things work, 
if I've done a good job, you're going to think about connection, really connecting with the people around you, the students, and understanding them. If I've done a really good job, you're going to leave here and say, well, I'm not feeling scared today. I must be wasting my time. And if I've done a really good job, as you go through your change, you'll remember to take it one step at a time, leading people who trust and follow you. I'm going to have to call it a, a close there. If anyone's interested in working virtually with us on apprenticeships, um, please get in touch because we want to really transform the way apprenticeships work because people are not taking advantage because of the physical travel, and we can remove all that and drive up the learning. Uh, my also secret goal is to reduce the amount of CO2 produced in the globe. Uh, our target for my company is, personally, we want to do 5% of the world's CO2. I think we'll get there with Cube because it's going to change the way the whole dynamics work. So if you want to be part of that, that's also good. I finished. Is it okay? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I went around the back. I Eddie, should have gone around the front. <laughs> Eddie, you were absolutely amazing. That was brilliant, yep. wasn't it? Come on, we can do a better round of applause than that. <laughs> it was quite funny watching from the side then as well. You look, look, looked like a right show. It was hilarious. <laughs> no, I loved it. Um, but it just really makes you think, doesn't it? And it's filled with energy as well. We're going to have a break in a moment. So uh, the refreshments will be served in the usual place in Hall 3. If you haven't already done so, just take a time to visit exhibitions and the like. No, I didn't. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm going shortly because I've got to go and present Watchdog tonight. So, so. this is the last we'll see of her. We just oh, thought it was important you. to say thank you. So we've got some lovely flowers oh, for you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. That's all right. Um, Steph, Steph is. Um, Feel a bit embarrassed. Ste I know she's embarrassed. <laughs> Steph is our favourite presenter um, for all sorts of reasons, and um, partly because she says things to Anne Milne that none of us dare to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, we're hoping that we can get you next year. Because, yeah, um, uh, well, I love it. And, and thank you, everybody. And, and I, I will stick to my promise about coming to visit as many colleges as I can. And, and I told you not to say that. I know you oh, did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think I really think it's important, everything you do. I really do. And I will keep battling at work to try and get as much of it as I can on telly. And, uh, yeah, and I was just thinking, Eddie would be a great TV presenter, wouldn't he? We yeah. should get him doing some of it as well. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, and I'll, hopefully I'll see you again uh, sometime visiting your colleges over the next year. Thank you. Brilliant. In summer 2019, we'll celebrate outstanding BTEC students, teachers, schools, colleges and training providers from around the world at the 9th Annual BTEC Awards. So this is your chance to nominate your BTEC stars. I think this event is really important because it showcases the diversity of the people doing BTEC. Nominations are now open for 2019. It's easier than ever to enter. There are more chances to recognise outstanding students and great teaching. And there'll be everyone from business leaders to Olympic champions cheering you on. So celebrate your BTEC stars and submit your nomination today.